talking about pseudoscience in mental health. So this is a, uh, a topic that is quite near and dear to my heart. Uh, I actually have a small contribution there in the HUP chapter, or in the HUP book, which you'll, you'll read about eventually. Uh, so Stephen asked me to contribute a little thing to that. And then uh, for those of you who don't know, a huge part of my you know, non-clinical work is actually about critical thinking and uh, fighting against pseudoscience and nonsense, both within the clinical field and outside of it. So I teach classes in critical thinking. Uh, I'm trying to think if anybody, I don't think anybody in here, Elbin did. I think Elbin had that in my class. Tristan had it. So I'm trying to look over. I think those are the only two. So um, they you know, took my class in critical thinking, which obviously already makes them better than the rest of you. It's fine. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I'd flip my hair too, but I go, I don't have any. That's okay. So, uh, but this is something very, very dear to me. Uh, and one of the reasons why you all are reading the Hup book and doing those assignments is because the sheer breadth of nonsense, pseudoscientific bullshit out there in the realm of mental health um, is much larger than the scientific evidence-based things. Um, and that includes the different types of therapy and interventions, as well as the sheer number of practitioners out there that are doing these various things. So we'll see that here in a minute, but just a little preamble there. Um, so let's talk about uh, science versus opinions. Uh, so Hippocrates, of course, about 2,500 years ago, uh, said, not in English, of course, in Greek, it's translated. Uh, but he said, there are in fact two things, science and opinion. The former begets knowledge, the latter ignorance. And unfortunately, what you all are going to encounter as you move throughout your careers is huge numbers of people that are basing their practices, what they do, on not science, but on opinion. Uh, and that's very problematic, as we'll see a lot of. Now, this isn't just a problem within the mental health field, though. Um, the field of health generally, worldwide, uh, is a very expensive field, right? There's a lot of money that's spent every year on health. Uh, so here in the United States alone, we spend approximately $3 trillion per year on health care which amounts to around $10,000 per person, right? Um, that's a lot of money. Uh, it's actually more than in a lot of other developed nations for various reasons. Uh, but even other nations spend up to 10% of their GDP on healthcare. Um, that's a huge amount of money, right? So we should want to know as the public generally, is that money being spent well or is it being spent poorly? Um, so having some sort of accountability there. So in other words, are we spending that money on things that you know we know are reliable and likely to help change or on things that are not? And so before we begin talking about kind of what those options are, let's talk about some definitions, right? Because I think it's important to get everybody kind of on the same page. And the first two definitions I want to talk about are what are called um, alternative and complementary medicine and then integrative health. So uh, alternative and complementary or complementary and alternative, you'll hear it kind of done both ways, uh, are those approaches to healthcare that are developed outside of what's considered conventional medicine or healthcare. Um, sometimes you'll see this referred to as Western or mainstream uh, healthcare. So that's how the National Center for Integrative uh, Health defines it. And it defines integrative healthcare as being conventional and complementary approaches applied together in a coordinated fashion. So uh, integrative healthcare is taking those conventional things as well as this complementary and alternative or CAM uh, and using those two things together. And I think 
this is a term that has had a, um, a massive increase in use over about the last decade. So a lot of you will probably be familiar with or have seen uh, various clinics and things like that or referring to themselves as, you know, Edmund Integrative Healthcare or, um, you know, they talk about, well, what do we do here? We do integrative healthcare. And this is, this is a relatively new term, um, which sounds, sounds nice, like let's integrate it, or they'll say something like, you know, we do holistic care or something like that, um, which sounds nice, but the question is, um, is it, <laughs> and is it effective, is it useful? So let's talk about another definition which uh, I know most of you are quite familiar with already, which is the definition of evidence-based practice or EBP. So a couple different ways that we can define EBP is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. Or healthcare practice based on integrating knowledge from best available research evidence, clinical expertise, and patients' values and circumstances. Uh, and those three things, research, expertise, patients' values and circumstances, are sometimes referred to as the, uh, the three legs of the EBP stool. Because um, if you just have like one leg on a stool, not very stable, right? Two legs? also not very stable, it turns out, right? You're gonna fall. Um, and so instead we've got these this tripod there, which we can set on and be pretty stable with. Now, what's interesting when you look at the EBP is that it's not talking about uh, specific kinds of treatments, right? It's not talking about conventional versus alternative or complementary or integrative. It's talking about, hey, we're gonna use those things that have the best evidence to support their use, whatever that is. And it doesn't matter where it was developed, if it was developed in you know, Western mainstream or Eastern or you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, wherever. It doesn't matter as long as it's really high quality research supporting its use. And for most of us who practice EBP, that leg of the stool, the research evidence, is the biggest one, right? So it's, it's a very large leg. The other two are smaller legs, uh, necessary to help balance things, but the research leg is the biggest one. And so, you know, what are we doing at evidence-based practice? Well, we're using therapies, we're using assessments, we're using medications, treatments that have been demonstrated to be effective and demonstrated to be effective in these well-controlled trials. Now, this is actually uh, surprising to a lot of folks now, but this is a relatively new term. So uh, our first kind of operational definitions of EBP only date back about 25 years. And in terms of psychology, um, it's really about that old as well. Um, so. Most people think of medicine, right? Um, physical medicine, physicians. It's like, of course, well, of course they're evidence-based. Why are they, well, they're, they're all based on science. But it turns out not so much. Um, and the history of medicine has been rife with things that we now know are either actively dangerous um, or at the very least not effective, right? And it turns out psychology's history is the same as we'll see. Now, one of the things that I want to just kind of give everybody a little background on is that uh, evidence-based practice is something that has a very long history, right? So our, our first real clinical trials uh, date back to the 1700s, um, and they involved limes. Limes, L-I-M-E-S, right? The things we use to make margaritas. Uh, or at least that's what I'm most familiar with limes for. Um, limes, are limes medicine, right? Do you go to the doctor and he's like, I think, you know, Evelyn, I think you need to take two limes and call me in the morning sort of thing, right? Um, that would be pretty interesting. Um, but our first real kind of controlled trials and clinical trials did involve limes and they involved limes uh, in the treatment of scurvy. 
So scurvy, for those of you who are not pirates, uh, is not something that we see a lot of anymore, right? So um, scurvy is a, a disease that we now know is caused by uh, a lack of certain vitamins, particularly vitamin C. So when British sailors in the 15, 16, 1700s would go on these very, very long voyages, um, a large number of them would develop scurvy. And they would develop scurvy because of the kinds of foods that they were eating, which were primarily things like um, salted meats, dried breads, uh, things that could you know, survive at sea for, for extended periods of time. One of the physicians with the Royal Navy in the 1700s, though, observed that not all of the sailors got scurvy. And so he started trying to look and see, like, well, why is that? Like, what's different about these groups of sailors? Because uh, it wasn't like an individual sailor on a ship. It'd be like the entire ship was fine. This entire ship, not fine. And what he started noticing was that those ships that were fine typically had large amounts of fruits that they were eating because of the different places they would pull into port and restock on food. And in particular, they were having oranges, limes, lemons, things like that. Now, he didn't know the mechanism. We didn't even know what vitamins were back then, right? Um, but he said, okay, well, what do we need to do is we need to start stocking our ships up that are going on these long voyages with limes, lemons, oranges, things that are going to keep for a fairly long time and make sure that our sailors are eating some, right? Like every day, every couple days, like you need a lime. Now, because limes actually lasted the best at that time, this is why British sailors began to be known as limeys. Uh, and that's kind of a slang term that's actually still around for the British. Because when the sailors pulled into port, they would have their buckets or barrels of limes there on their ships. Um, and so that physician was able to do a controlled trial, right, where he gave buckets of, you know, barrels of limes to certain ships, didn't to others who were going on about the same voyages, see what happens, right? Who gets scurvy, who doesn't, right? He didn't understand the mechanism at the time, of course, but that's how these first kind of controlled trials worked, is, well, let's try a couple different things, let's see what works. But the thing about moving forward and doing evidence-based practice is that there's always pushback. And there's always pushback from people who want to keep doing what it is they're doing. One of the, I think, most disturbing tales from early healthcare, uh, early modern healthcare, is hand washing. So, you know, we all, especially over the last year, wash our hands a lot, right? And we wash our hands a lot to do why. Why do we wash our hands a lot? So we don't get sick, like, so we don't transmit disease, um, so we don't give it to other people, exactly. Now, that wasn't always the case, and it wasn't always the case for physicians. So if you actually go back about 150 years, hand washing wasn't really a thing that most physicians did. And in London, in the 1850s, um, some, or one physician in particular, became very interested in why midwives seem to have much higher birth rates, live birth rates, uh, and much fewer complications post-birth than most physicians who were delivering babies. And he started looking at the practices. And what he found is that, you know, the midwives that were delivering babies, um, they were tending to use large amounts of uh, hot water and soap to both clean themselves and to clean uh, the women when they were giving birth. Um, that was kind of the big difference he was able to see between the physicians delivering children and the midwives. Now what was happening with the physicians, particularly where he was, which is the Royal uh, College there uh, in London, was that a lot of times physicians would go into the uh, the birthing rooms directly from dissection chambers. So they would be dissecting human corpses 
and then someone would come in, they would need to be birthed, and the physician would put the scalpels down, walk in there, get that baby. And it turns out huge numbers of the women who the physicians were delivering ended up with different kinds of fevers and diseases because the physicians weren't cleaning themselves in any way between the dissection table and the cadavers. And now I have my hands inside this living human being. And when this was kind of brought up at the Royal College um, and the physician was like, look at my data, I have this data, here's a way that we can help improve our patients' lives. He was roundly criticized, ostracized, almost rejected as a physician because they were like, that doesn't make any sense. How does that happen? There's no way that that could happen. Again, because they didn't understand the mechanisms that were occurring, right? So we didn't have a germ theory of disease at that point. People didn't know how diseases were really transmitted. Um, and they were like, well, how, how could this be something that's happening here? But it turns out, yes, washing your hands in between cadavers and delivering babies, pretty necessary thing to do if you want those people to be healthy. And eventually, you know, now you don't see physicians going from the dissection chamber right to the delivery room, right? Like that's not a thing that you do now. Um, and it's because of people like him fighting against um, these kind of outdated ideas and really trying their best to say, hey, let's look at the evidence. Let's let the evidence guide us. But there's always pushback, right? And it doesn't matter if you're talking about physicians or if you're talking about uh, physical therapists or if you're talking about psychologists and clinicians uh, of various kinds who are working in mental health. Right? There's always pushback. So... Let's stop for a minute. Questions, thoughts, responses, what do we got? It's a pretty gross story, right? Like, I'm up to my elbows in a cadaver, now I'm delivering your baby. Like, that's, that's pretty gross, I get that. But it's it interesting to think, uh, it's interesting to think about a lot of people are very skeptical how a lot of people are very skeptical about um, the changing in like the CDC guidelines over the past year sure. uh, in regard to COVID-19 and all of this new information that we're gaining every single day. It's it. I can understand at the time why they could be skeptical, but it doesn't necessarily obviously make it right. It didn't make it right. Um, but I, you just kind of see how that has correlated even into today's um, COVID response. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things that most people still don't grasp, I think, is how science responds to evidence and changes appropriately, right? Um, it's like, well, you told me this. Okay, well, we're telling you this now, and here's the reason. Right? <laughs> we have more evidence, we have more studies, we have more research results. That's why we're going to stop doing this, and we should do this other thing. Um and a lot of times, unfortunately, that's seen as like, oh, you're flip-flopping, you don't know what you're doing, or you know, you're wishy-washy. It's like, no, I'm responding to new evidence, right? I'm changing based on what we know now. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't know that before. Now we do. So should we keep doing something that's wrong now? No, right? Obviously not. So, but a lot of people don't, don't get that. I think it also has to play into, like we talk about in psychology a lot, our schemas and how everybody has one. Because the issue with something as unprecedented as COVID-19 is that it is shattering those and it's not following the same rules as, you know, other illnesses that we've seen have followed. And so instead of just having a couple of people that are breaking away and saying and trying to stick really hard to those we have a whole society that's doing it and so and we come from an individualistic society where what i do i don't care how it affects everyone else um is kind of the mentality that we've all been raised on it for generations so i think that has a big play into what we've seen and why we see so much pushback against scientific evidence 
Yeah, I, I think that definitely falls into it, Tristan. Um, particularly when, you know, you've got, for example, the CDC guidelines saying, hey, you need to, um, you know, wash your hands, disinfect surfaces and so on, like for months, right? And then it's like, mm, I mean, you still should do that, but really it's through the air. Like the masks are the most important things to stop transmissibility. Um, and then people are like, well, you told me to wash my hands. I've been washing my hands for months. So it's like, well, that's good. Cause it turns out, you know, um, that's, that's healthy too. <laughs> like it didn't hurt you, uh, but this is really what we need to do. So it's, it's that kind of that response to change, which is hard for a lot of people, right? Like people tend to like to keep doing what it is they're doing, right? Um, things like confirmation biases, of course, and uh, kind of behavioral inertia all, you know, play into that uh, for sure. Now, when we, when we take a look at um, what you can call CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, um, some of us call it uh, so-called alternative medicine, uh, which is a fun acronym. Uh, you can work that out for yourself if you'd like. Uh, when we compare that to evidence-based practice, what we really are talking about is evidence-based practice is a way of making decisions. And so a way of making decisions where I say, um, okay, well, what's the best evidence available to help me achieve a particular outcome for this individual? CAM, on the other hand, is just referring to a type of treatment, right? It's a treatment that's, you know, non-mainstream or alternative or so on. But for those of us who are practicing evidence-based uh, psychology, evidence-based medicine, we don't divide things into alternative or conventional treatments. Instead, what we do is we look at what's called the levels of evidence. And uh, myself and my, my co-author of the, the book that this comes from, uh, Jacques Rousseau, we decided to, to put kind of three levels of evidence together that provide a pretty rough guide, uh, but a pretty good guide into whether or not something is something we should use, right? So we divided things into what are called evidence-based treatments, poorly studied treatments, and then non-evidence-based treatments. So you've got, again, kind of three levels here, and it's kind of like a stoplight, right? You've got red, you've got yellow, you've got green. And your green are those evidence-based treatments. And those are therapies, medications, assessments uh, that have been reliably shown to help you effectively diagnose or treat uh, or ca cure various kinds of symptoms or conditions that people are having. And you can use this across any area of health. You know, we're obviously focused on psychology here, but um, you can use that, you know, evidence-based treatments. Those poorly studied treatments, that's kind of your yellow light, right? Let's like, let's pump the brakes a little bit. Let's slow down before we just barrel ahead and use this. Because it's something that either, you know, we haven't studied it well enough to know if it actually has an effective change or if it's actually able to do what it says it does. Or if there's a lot of conflicting evidence, right? So it can be, well, there's, you know, there's three studies that show that this seems to work and there's four studies that show that it doesn't. We can't really say, you know, with a great amount of certainty that this is or isn't accurate. Um, so, and that's kind of, again, those are our yellow lights, right? And then our red lights are our non-evidence-based treatment where we know that these things have been reliably shown not to work. So not just we don't know, but hey, no, we know, and they don't really help. And these are the ones, of course, where you, you know, you should be completely avoiding those. So one thing that I think is really important in uh, mental health in particular is understanding that no treatment is a panacea. Right? So a panacea is the name for some sort of general cure-all. Um, and this would be something that, oh, I'll give it to you and it'll fix everything. Kind of like the old uh, snake oil salesman or uh, 
Uh, a lot of people that you would <laughs> see peddling kind of various kinds of alternative cures, which is, oh no, if you do this one thing, right, it'll fix all these treatments. And the reason that there are no panaceas is because the very same treatment can be evidence-based for one thing, but not evidence-based, or it could even be poorly studied for something else. And this is something that I see um, mental health practitioners do especially, which is I've got this one thing that I do, maybe it's evidence-based for this population, but I'm using it for everything, right? So, oh, hey, this has been shown to work for this problem in this population. Let's do everybody this treatment. Um, you know, probably the easiest one that you're most familiar with to think about are uh, bacterial infections, right? So if I have a bacterial infection and I take an antibiotic, that's considered an evidence-based treatment. But antibiotics are not panaceas. So they don't help with every kind of infection. Right? So if I have some sort of a viral problem, antibiotics are not going to help, right? Because there they are very different mechanisms that are causing the problems that I'm experiencing. And this is important to remember in psychology, right? Just because this treatment works well with this population or for this problem doesn't mean that it necessarily will for everything. That's one of the reasons why in our workshops, I'm not just telling you all, all right, here is the way you treat all problems, right? Like here it is. No, we have to be flexible. Even if we say cognitive behavioral therapy is the, you know, the most well-supported treatment uh, orientation generally for mental health problems, that doesn't mean that you treat every problem the same way. So I don't do, for example, exposure and response prevention to help fix someone's uh, autism, right? They're both mental health problems, fears, autism, but you don't treat them in the same way, right? I wouldn't do, um, you know, social skills training to help treat someone's depression. Why? Well, because they're not the same thing, right? Even if both of those might fall under this umbrella of cognitive behavioral therapy, that doesn't mean that they're all the exact same thing. And so that's something to keep in mind, especially as we go throughout this. It's also important, like Elijah and Tristan both uh, kind of alluded to, is to remember that these are not static categories, right? Things can move between these categories. And they move between them thanks to new research, new understanding of what's going on. So you can have something move from you know, poorly studied into evidence-based or from poorly studied down into non-evidence-based. Or you can even have something move from evidence-based to non-evidence-based. Right? If there's new, more effective research showing that there are problems originally. And there's, you know, there's a lot of, of things out there that we can uh, kind of talk about, but this is the main reason why dividing things into sort of mainstream versus conventional uh, isn't really effective because it may not always be in that category, right? We want to think about these things in terms of how much evidence do they have to support their use, not what do we call it, right? What category does it come from? So in psychology, one example of this would be mindfulness. Um, so 30 years ago, um, when mindfulness-based therapies started becoming um, a thing and being developed, they were definitely in that poorly studied treatments range, right? We didn't really have a lot of data to back them up. But over the last 15 years in particular, um, we've got an increasing amount of research showing that, hey, these seem pretty legitimate for these particular problems. Same thing with acceptance and commitment therapy, which, you know, 20 years ago when I first started graduate school was this very like new thing that uh, was just being started, hadn't really done any, much research on it or anything. And now it's, it's a well, uh, well established, uh, valid treatment for a, a fairly wide range of problems that people experience. So 
you shift between the categories based on your evidence. But that makes much more sense than trying to say, well, this is a mainstream, this is alternative, this is you know, a complementary kind of medicine. It's like, okay, well, let's just talk about the level of evidence for it. Right? Part of this has been, um, I think, purposeful uh, in terms of trying to change the names or trying to um, kind of muddy the waters a bit. So if we look at uh, the kind of evolution over the last 30 years of governmental agencies that are involved in or uh, you know, kind of in charge of doing research on these things that we call alternative or complementary medicines, uh, there have been some very large shifts in their name. Right? So when this was first started, uh, this was called the OAM, the Office of Alternative Medicine. And then it shifted a few years after that to being called the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And then it shifted about six years ago to being called the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine uh, and being part of NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And so if you look at that name, you'll notice that there's a word that has dropped out right it was there in the first two alter or uh, you know variations of the name it's not there anymore and the name is alternative right um why why did that get dropped from the name of this institute right uh this center well because alternative has a lot of fairly negative connotations to it right um so you all probably if your uh, car breaks down you don't go to an alternative mechanic, right? Or if you, um, I don't know, uh, let's say that you're trying to go from point A to point B. You're trying to figure out how to get there. You don't look at alternative geography to help figure out which one or which way to go, right? I mean, most map makers agree that we would drive on I-35 to get down to Dallas. But there's an alternative map maker that says instead what we need to do is bore straight down into the into the ground and then we'll hit a wormhole that will allow us to instantly transport there right there's this alternative geography we've got to talk about people no like we don't do that right so why would we want to have an alternative medicine because what's it the alternative to it's the alternative to evidence-based medicine, it turns out. Um, so they definitely dropped that term purposefully. And you'll see now they're focused on complementary or integrative uh, medicine and health, which is a bit wishy-washy, I think. So, um, but it's kind of a way to stay, unfortunately, uh, more relevant, as is why they, you know, change that name and use the kind of classifications that they use. So the NCCIH now doesn't say this is evidence-based or not. Instead, what it does uh, is it just groups treatments by their kind. Right? It doesn't say here's the level of evidence for this. It just says, hey, this is uh, mind-body medicine. This is, you know, biologically based, you know, complementary medicine, instead of just saying, well, here are the things that we have evidence to show this works. And in fact, on their website, they actually describe a lot of treatments as being evidence-based when they are completely non-evidence-based. So they, for example, um, list homeopathy and acupuncture as being uh, evidence-based treatments when they are not. Um, homeopathy, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, is, is what it is, is placebos. So homeopathic pills don't have any actual medications in them, which is one of the reasons why they can be sold over the counter, it turns out, uh, and you don't need a prescription for them. Uh, the whole idea behind homeopathy is that um, the more you dilute something, the stronger it gets, and that uh something that causes a symptom in a healthy person cures that symptom in a sick person yeah 
So, so in other words, not that any of you have ever done this, uh, but some people occasionally drink too much alcohol. Um, I know none of you ever have, but you've probably heard stories about it. Uh, a homeopathic remedy for a hangover would be we take the thing that causes a hangover, alcohol, okay? But I don't just like, oh, oh, uh, you know, Zach, you're drunk. Here, have some whiskey. No. I say, oh, no, Zach, you're drunk. You've got a hangover. Let me take a drop of this whiskey. Mix it into this, you know, vial of water. Stir it up real good. Take a drop of that. Mix it into another vial of water. Stir it up real good. Take a drop of that. Mix it into another vial of water. Stir it up real good. I'm going to do that seven more times at least. And then I'm going to take a drop of that and I'm going to put it onto an unmedicated pill. Like a sugar pill. And then I'm going to give that to you, Zachary, to cure your hangover. Because the more diluted something gets, the stronger the effect, right? No, that makes no damn sense at all, right? Like, it's completely ridiculous. Um, if that was true, I could go, you know, pour a, a, a bottle of wine into Lake Arcadia, and then we could all go have the biggest party ever, right? And just go out there and just drink it all up and just get drunk as hell. Um, not how it works, though. So, and then acupuncture, of course, many of you have probably heard it, it's sticking needles into various parts of your body. Uh, but needles that are into various uh, supposed energy lines, and you stick them into specific places called meridians that supposedly unblock those energy lines and channels, which then causes you to become healthy. Um, which, of course, totally makes sense. Except for the fact that meridians aren't real and energy lines through your body aren't real. Uh, and when we test homeopathy, what's really fun is that we can do uh, real home, or I'm sorry, acupuncture, real acupuncture, right? Where a trained acupuncturist comes in, puts the needles where they're supposed to go. Or we can do what we call sham acupuncture, which is a person comes in and then I just kind of randomly place the needles wherever the hell I want. Uh, and it turns out people get equally better if you're doing the sham or the real one. So it means you're not really the needles making the treatment, right? And we'll see more about that here in a moment. But this, you know, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health um, doesn't, you know, do a good job of differentiating evidence versus non-evidence based treatments and instead just lumps them into these three categories, uh, which are pretty ridiculous. You've got natural products, mind and body practices, and then anything else. Um, so it's, not, it's like the worst categories of all time, let's be honest. Uh, mind and body practices. Well, what, what does that even mean? Like everything I do is involving my body or my mind, right? Even if I'm taking these natural products, it's involving my body, right? Anyway, it's a big mess up there. Uh, so, you know, what we're going to stick with is we're going to stick with levels of evidence, right? What's the level of evidence supporting this category? Um, and again, I think part of this is just purposeful confusion on the this national office uh, and the people who are supporting that because for the vast majority of the things they list on there, they wouldn't be able to say that they're evidence-based in any way, shape, or form. Um, so, purposeful confusion. One of uh, my favorite performers is this Australian named Tim Minchin. And he's got a spoken word piece uh, that is just brilliant called Storm. Um, and you can go look it up if you've got Tim Minchin Storm on YouTube. Uh, there's actually this uh, short, about 12 minute animated film that someone made of it. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, but within that, he has this line that you see here on the, on the screen, which is, by definition, I begin. Alternative medicine, I continue, has either not been proved to work or been proved not to work. Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proved to work? Medicine. Right? Because that's 
that's what it is. The alternative is that it doesn't work, right? Or we don't know if it works. Um, you know, think about it. If if you go break your arm, right? Let's say, let's say Elbin's skateboarding and he falls and breaks his arm. Do you want to go to someone who is like, all right, let's do some x-rays. Uh, oh, I can see. Here's where it's broken. We're going to cast it up. You'll be all right here in about six weeks. Or would you want someone to be like, no, we could do this, right? This is what we know is going to help it heal. But have you considered some crystals? And maybe we just wrap a few crystals around it, shoot some laser light through that, and then the healing power of the crystals will help fix it. You want to try that one too? Like it's an alternative to the medicine. It's an alternative to what we know is going to work, but interested? They're really pretty. Um, I, used to, I say crystals because I have crystals on the mind. Hold on just a second. Let me show you why. When you're moderately uh, well-known, people send you books uh, to review. So this one you can see. Crystal Healing, the psych Science and Psychology Behind What Works what doesn't, and why. Uh, so I've been reading this to give it a review. Uh, it's actually really cool because it's a, uh, a mineralogist and a psychologist essentially showing people, here's my crystal healing's bullshit. Um, so it's actually a really fun book, but that's why I used crystals as an example because it's on the brain. So Sounds like all it's missing is some astrology. Yeah, they don't, they don't go into any astrology in here, uh, but they do have some really nice photos uh, and they do talk about some really great, let me see, hold on. They talk about what metaphysics are versus scientific method. So yeah, really cool book, really fun book. So, um, so if any of you have crystal healers in your life, when this is published, you can, you know, direct them to that. All right, questions, thoughts, reactions so far? Do you know anything for essential oils? Uh, you mean any books to kind of show? Uh, I, I wish I had an entire book that did that. I'd have lots of articles that show why they're nonsensical, gotcha. Um, so certainly shoot me an email and I can send those to you, so. There is a documentary series on Netflix that kind of goes over essential oils, a lot of homeopathic things that are really big right now. Um, I'll try to like look and see what it was because I was watching it for a while. I forgot the title, but I'll try to find it. And my mom watched it and she likes essential oils and she was very upset <laughs> when the essential oils one came on. And I was like, well. <laughs> yeah, uh, essential oils, they're, they're pretty fun. The, the only essential oil that we use here on the farm uh, is WD-30, so, or WD-40, I'm sorry. So we went up a notch. So that's, that's our essential oil. Uh, yeah, lots of people like them. They smell nice. Not going to cure your problems, uh, but they smell nice. So at least there's that, I guess. So, uh, all right. Now, why, why am I talking about this stuff, right? Well, I'm talking about it because it turns out shitloads of people use these things. Um, or if they're not using, you know, um, a whole bunch of different alternative medicines or CAMs, they may be using one. Um, and we've actually seen a very steady rise in the use of these across the last 50 years, um, a, a doubling or more. And if we look just broadly speaking, the most commonly used here in the United States, first is chiropractic, which um, for any of you who didn't know, those are not actual physicians and doctors. Um, homeopathy, uh, and then various kinds of herbal medicine and acupuncture. Uh, and the reason I mention these is because a lot of these products, including what chiropractors do, uh, claim to be able to treat mental health problems. Um, so there, when we wrote, uh, wrote our book on critical thinking and alternative health, 
I actually looked at the websites of the chiropractors here in Edmond um, just to see, you know, what is it that they're claiming they can treat? And they can treat, it turns out, everything, uh, anything that's wrong with you, um, including mental health conditions like ADHD, depression and anxiety, um, epilepsy and seizures. Um, one person said they can treat pregnancy. That's literally what they said. They can treat it. And I was like, I don't think that's a disease. Like it's a little, you know, it's a little parasitic. Yes. But I don't, I don't think a lot of people are treating that, but that's literally what his website said. Um, but for homeopathy, you can find all sorts of, uh, supposed homeopathic remedies for depression, anxiety, for bedwetting. I've seen those for all sorts of problems. And the same thing with various kinds of herbs and supplements, acupuncture. Uh, a lot of people have said they can use that to treat PTSD and stress and all other kinds of problems. So they're not limiting what they're doing to just the realm of physical health. Okay? There's also a lot of overlap where these uh, CAM practitioners claim that they're treating mental health problems as well. And there's a lot of money in this. Um, our best estimates are somewhere between 30 and $35 billion per year are spent here in the United States on various kinds of CAM remedies, treatments, etc. cetera. Uh, some states have uh, boards, right, where they license these kinds of folks like Oklahoma, uh, actually until recently, the Board of Psychology was in the same office building as the Board of Chiropractic, um, which is very embarrassing for psychology. Um, but, you know, you'll see people who are licensed acupuncturists or things like that, which gives this kind of air of like, oh, well, I guess I guess it's real. I guess we can treat it then. Uh, but remember, they also license things like dog groomers and, uh, you know, nail salons which don't help you, you know, magically get better from problems, uh, even though some of you are using that as part of your self-care and that's fine. So, so we've got a lot of things that uh, people spend a ton of money on, spend a ton of time and effort in. Um, and so, you know, why would they spend that money if it didn't work, right? Um, wouldn't they realize that these treatments were ineffective or didn't happen? And wouldn't they then try something else? And this is a really tricky question um, because the answer to this is essentially these treatments do work, but they don't work for the reasons people think they do. And this is a, this is a very tricky kind of thing right? because someone can go to the chiropractor and then they can feel better, right? Or they can take some homeopathy and feel better. Or they can go to a therapist who's doing uh, some sort of pseudoscientific, non-evidence-based practice, and they might end up feeling better. But the question is, are they feeling better because of that? Or is there something else happening? So we've been going for about an hour. Let's take a little quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about kind of how uh, different aspects of research are so important to figuring out what does and doesn't work. So let's let's do about a, about a ten minute break. Okay, see you guys about uh, three ten. Thanks. All right, hi everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Hopefully you got a little. A little relaxation, uh, stepped, you know, at least into your kitchen and got some more hot tea or something, who knows, uh, or vodka, I'm not, I'm not going to judge, I'm not going to judge, so. Uh, Quit giving away my secrets. <laughs> that's all right, you know, the We're in guys who aren't drinking just ran in there and did shots right quick, it's fine, I, I understand. For grad students, I don't think it's really a secret. <laughs> <laughs> no, that Irish liqueur goes really well with coffee. I'll try that. I've uh, not that I condone this or anything, of course, but uh, there are some peanut butter whiskeys now that really go well 
in hot chocolate uh, and in milkshakes, like a vanilla milkshake with a little little peanut butter whiskey in there. How about screwball? Uh, screwball's too sweet for me. I use one called uh, Burn Dog. So it's it's not quite as sweet and it's a higher, it's like 40%. So it's more like an actual whiskey, more like a liqueur than uh, Listen, screwball. Listen, all the alcohol he can get. <laughs> yes, basically, I do. So. Well, Don't blame me. Well, so um, where we had left off before the break was we were talking about um, kind of the importance of research in terms of guiding our decisions about what is and is not considered effective evidence-based practice, right? Um, so providers like you all, as you go out into the world, who rely on evidence-based treatments, evidence-based assessments, um, rely on those research studies to guide us in that. And the reason that we have to do that is because we as humans uh, are naturally extraordinarily biased uh, in our everyday decision-making. Uh, and I can talk about this for weeks and you know, Tristan and Elvin have heard me talk about this for weeks. Um, but we are really easily biased to uh, ignore certain kinds of information and pay more attention to others. We're also really easily influenced by social forces, um, things like advertising. And the third one is how strong the placebo effect is. Because it turns out it's a very insidious force in making people think that something is working when in reality, it's not an evidence-based treatment. So the placebo effect, I'm sure you guys have all heard of that before, right? But you know, when we try to define that, it's any kind of sham or inactive treatment or procedure that we then tell people actually is active, right? So I'm doing something that's not real, but I'm telling you it is. So like I mentioned earlier with those acupuncture studies where they had sham acupuncture, right? Uh, where we placed, you know, needles in places where they weren't supposed to go. Um, or in some of the studies, they're actually really clever and they use sham needles where they look like needles and they look like they're going into your skin and they kind of feel like it, but they don't actually penetrate the skin at all. Uh, they're these very clever retractable needles. Uh, so, you know, they look like, you know, you're, you're getting a real treatment or you're getting a pill that, you know, you're being told is going to have this or that effect. Uh, or we've even done things like fake surgeries, right? So placebo surgeries. Uh, to test to make sure that these things actually do work or that these treatments actually do work. Uh, and we have these in therapy as well, right? We have what are considered uh, sham or placebo therapies where there's no active ingredients. Uh, generally what these look like is these look kind of like what you all did in individual counseling, right? Which is reflection and reflection of content and emotion you know, being present, being, you know, kind of unconditionally positively regarding people, but not actually doing any active ingredients of treatment. And so that's why I actually, or I refer to uh, our folks who get through their first year uh, as being placebo therapists at that point, uh, because you, you know, you know how to be a placebo then. Um, and that's not to say that everyone who goes to a therapist who's only doing that that no one ever gets better. It turns out a lot of people do see some sort of improvement. But the question is why? And that's why we have to have research in order to help figure that out. Because when someone gets a placebo, a lot of times people who get placebos show improvements, even if there's no active treatment. Um, and we can see this across large numbers of different kinds of areas. Um, one of my favorite things for people to do in terms of placebos is to serve their friends uh, non-alcoholic beer or wine, but you tell them that it's alcoholic and you see what happens, right? Uh, 
O'Doul's was particularly good for that when I was in college. And you could, you know, people are acting crazy and drunk and you're like, look, suckers, it was, there was no alcohol. You're all being ridiculous, right? Um, and we have carefully controlled research studies uh, in labs that show people do those things. Uh, this placebo effect is really powerful. Um, the term placebo, just so you know, comes from Latin. It's a Latin phrase that means essentially, I will please. Uh, so, you know, I will please the person that's giving me this and telling me that this works or this will help. Uh, and then I'm like, oh, I think, I think that's good. Now, here's the thing about placebos, though. Um, they're very powerful, for sure. We've got decades of research on that. But they're more powerful and pronounced, and we can see those effects better in subjective tests. So in other words, um, when I ask someone how they're doing, as opposed to actually measuring change. So why is this important in psychology? Think about how we typically measure progress in psychology. How do we measure progress? Do we measure it through, you know, changes in blood serum levels or uh, you know, cortisol levels or... No, for the most part, we ask him, how you doing? What's changed, right? How you feeling? Which it turns out is incredibly subjective, even if we're using good assessment instruments. And so we know the placebo is stronger for that, right? Um, on the physical sort of side of things, one of my favorite examples of this is having people with asthma use sham inhalers. Uh, again, in controlled trial, not just like doctors are like, you know what, this will be funny. Let's give them some sham. No, but like in controlled trials, we give them sham inhalers, they look like the real thing, they sound like the real thing, uh, they feel things coming out of them, but there's no medication in it. And you still see people saying that, I feel better. But when you actually measure lung functioning, it doesn't change. So that subjective aspect for things like pain, for anxiety and depressive symptoms, for other kinds of mental health symptoms, for uh, parents reporting on their children's behavior via things like uh, the CBCL or the BASC, we're much more likely to see those placebo effects in subjective kinds of tests, which means psychology is at a particularly high risk for that, right? Um, now, we do know that placebos cause changes. Um, they can cause biological changes, which is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, telling someone that this is a stimulant medication and will help them focus, we tend to see higher amounts of activation in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, not as much as we see with actual stimulant medications, but still an increase. Um, we see people who are giving medication that say this will help with their pain. They produce higher levels of uh, opioids in their body to help you know, reduce pain. Lots of interesting stuff that happens um, because, you know, our expectations of what's going to happen when we are engaging in some sort of treatment really impact how we feel and how we behave. Um, so, again, if you give somebody that's, you know, expecting a beer, you give them a beer that's not alcoholic. Uh, if they're told it's alcoholic, there's a really good chance that they will experience some of those effects. They'll feel as if it's they're intoxicated. They may act as if they're intoxicated. So slurring words, uh, being clumsy, things like that. And this can go for, you know, any sort of substance, really. So in the same way, if I tell you that this medication is going to make you less anxious, make you less afraid, make you less depressed, etc., there's a good, strong chance that we'll see a, a, a fairly significant placebo effect there. But there's also what we call a nocebo effect. And the nocebo effect is when you feel worse after receiving some sort of a treatment because you're expected to feel worse. You're told you're going to feel worse. Um, so if we give people medications and say that this is going to increase your sensitivity to pain, we see people reporting more pain, right? 
um, which is pretty interesting. Now, objectively, they're not experiencing more pain, but they're reporting that more. Um, so the placebo can work on both sides, right? It can work for you or it can work against you. And if we want to make a placebo stronger, right? We turns out we have lots of research on how to do that. And we can make placebos stronger by first um, being very friendly as the person providing the placebo, um, being very interested, very engaged with the individual, um, all things that you should think, oh, that's what we as mental health professionals are supposed to do, right? Uh, so that's, it turns out, one way to make placebos stronger is to be a nice, engaged person. Uh, and then basically the more um, fancy the placebo is, the better it works. So for example, if I give you a pill, that doesn't work as well as a capsule, which doesn't work as well as an injection, which doesn't work as well as a surgery. Um, think about that in terms of things like therapy. If I've got a, a fancier kind of therapy or I'm giving it all these fancy names, I'm wrapping it in a fancy package and talking about, oh, here's what's happening at the brain and this is going on and you're integrating these halves of your brain or you're, you know, you're activating this or that particular center of your brain. All that does is help increase the placebo strength, which is pretty interesting and has big implications when you look a lot at a lot of these kind of pseudoscientific therapies and treatments that are out there. Because what we see is we see a whole lot of what we call neurobabble, which is talking about biology and the brain in particular, uh, when you don't actually have evidence to back that up and support that. So um, one example of this that's out there, um, are these kind of brain training places, right? Or, or programs where, you know, you download this app on your phone and, you know, it increases your, your, your brain, uh, you know, power in some way, or it decreases the age of your brain or things like that. Um, or, oh, what's that, what's that place that's big out there? School psychology it talks about brains. Are you talking about brain balance? Yes, brain balance, that place, yes. Um, so that's, uh, you know, they talk a lot about integrating the different halves of the brain, and, uh, you know, personalizing it based on this or that. Um, turns out it's all bullshit. Uh, they don't even have licensed providers at these places of any kind of service. Um, and it was all started by a chiropractor, uh, turns out. so who again, aren't real physicians. Um, and their entire thing is based on uh, a scam artist from the 1890s, who's also Canadian. So, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't help you out, does it? Uh, doesn't make you look better. So, can't trust them. So, we know we can make placebos stronger. Uh, so, placebos are a big issue, uh, but we have another big issue in research, which is what we call regression to the mean. And this is where when I measure something that's in an extreme direction, it's most likely going to regress or move back to the mean, the normal, the more that I measure it. The reason that this is problematic in mental health is because when do people come in and seek treatment? Yeah, they don't come in when they're like, you know what, I'm feeling pretty good, but I think I still would like to see a therapist. Or, you know, my kid's fine, but let's just go in and just see what happens, right? No, they come in and they're like, my life is a disaster, right? Things are terrible. Things are very, very far from the norm, right? The mean. Um, so people, t we tend to see them when they're coming in for treatment, when they're at an extreme side of a particular symptom or cluster of symptoms or behavior. So one way to think about this um, pretty easily understood, I think, is to think about you all and developing a headache, right? Everyone in here has had a headache at some point, right? 
And it usually isn't just like I'm walking along and then oh, it's out of nowhere, right? Usually it starts small and it builds over time, right? So you're at the mean of no headache. And it starts small and it starts building until pretty much you're at this extreme value. You're like, oh my God, I've got to rub that headache. This hurts. What do I do? Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some aspirin. I'm going to take some ibuprofen. I'm going to do whatever it is that I normally do when I have a headache. And then... Hey, I'm feeling better, right? And like, oh, my headache went away. So obviously the medication worked that I took, right? Well, not for sure. Because it turns out there's, in this example, and in most examples of treatment, there's actually three reasons why you could have gotten better. One is, yes, that, that medication you took really did decrease the pain. But it could have just been a placebo effect. Right? So you may have expected to get better, so you felt better. Or it could have just been that across time, regardless of what you did, that pain would have went away. And that's what we call regression to the mean. And so it doesn't matter if you took you know, that medication or not, most people don't have headaches forever. And so it would, probably would have naturally gone away. And each of these three things are plausible and possible. And so that's why we have to engage in research to be able to sort out which one it is. And this is the same thing with different kinds of therapies, right? Someone comes in to see me, I see them for a few months, they're doing better on whatever particular metric we're measuring. I think, I'm pretty good, look at that. And they're like, he's pretty good, look at this. But am I? I mean, I am, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, you know, it could have just been that regardless of whether or not they saw someone, that problem would have gotten better. It could have been that it wasn't really me and what I did. It was just a placebo effect of coming into therapy. And it's only if we have these well-controlled clinical trials that we can determine whether or not this treatment actually works. And we have to ask not just, does this treatment work? But does this treatment work better than a placebo? And would this treatment or this condition have improved naturally over time, even if we don't intervene? And if we say yes and no, right? So yes, this works better than a placebo and no, the condition would not naturally improve over time. Then we can actually say, yeah, this seems to have some good evidence to support the use of this particular treatment for this particular problem. But if we don't control for those things, then we won't know. Um, you know, one example that I can give you all related to, <clears throat> to kind of youth is that there's a um, treatment program that is becoming more popular. It's not super popular yet, uh, but there are some places in the city in the metro area that are kind of starting to try to push this that's called CPP or child parent psychotherapy. And child parent psychotherapy um, sounds nice. It's a good, good solid name. Um, they say that you need to be coming in for at least 50 sessions to treat these problems. 50 sessions, right? That's, that's an entire year on a weekly basis, right? Um, that's a lot of sessions, right? I, I have some people that I've, I've tracked and treated across about a decade now, and I still haven't seen them for 50 sessions, right? Like, you know, I'll see them for a few sessions, and then they'll come back for boosters later, right? Um, but 50 sessions. And they say, you know, oh, well, we have some such wonderful outcomes and things like that but they're not doing a lot of comparison to regression to the mean. And they're not saying, okay, well, would these people have just gotten better naturally across a year or a year and a half, even if they weren't coming in here for 50 sessions of treatment and not comparing it to placebo treatments. So can I say that it really works or it works well? Well, not if I don't know that it works better than a placebo, 
and not if I don't know would these changes have occurred even if we didn't do anything. So when we're doing evidence-based practice, we really have to do these very carefully controlled research trials. And what we tend to rely on are what are called randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind procedures whenever possible. This is our highest level of evidence, kind of our gold standards. Because if you're not doing randomized, then you don't know whether or not your groups were different to begin with. If you're not doing placebo controls, then you don't know whether or not people would have gotten better regardless of what your treatment was. And if you're not doing double blind procedures, then you don't know whether or not your own biases or the biases of the people in the study impacted the results. So it's only when we do these kinds of high quality trials that we can actually determine does evidence exist to support us really using this? Can we consider this an evidence-based treatment? And doing you know, um, these kinds of randomized clinical trials or controlled trials is not easy in any way, shape, or form. It's very difficult. It's very time-consuming. It takes a lot of effort. But the end result is that we actually are much more certain about what it is that we're proclaiming our certainty of, right? So in other words, I actually know my results are more accurate. Because if I, again, if I don't follow a group across time, then I won't know whether or not, you know, with a wait list control, that this group would have just naturally changed, right? I don't know if I don't give them a placebo, if is this a true effect or is it a placebo effect? And so that's why we have to throw people through this kind of uh, intensive treatment outcome study to really know this or that's what's happened. So studies that don't meet these kinds of criteria can show that a treatment works even if it actually doesn't. And that's what's very, very tricky, all right, about kind of looking at the research literature is that it turns out it's really easy to design a treatment trial to show that your treatment works. It's really easy to do so. But it's difficult to design a treatment trial that actually shows that it works. And so when we see lots and lots of evidence or studies out there where people are relying on non-randomized, non-placebo controlled, non-double blinded studies, we can't trust those because they don't tell us the whole picture. Now, especially early in a research program, that's not necessarily what you're finding, right? And that's okay, as long as that's what we're moving towards, right? So we don't stop with just naturalistic studies. That's where we start. We start and then we move more towards these randomized, double-blinded controlled trials. So this kind of, you know, again, gold standard is really what we have to rely on for us as mental health practitioners too. Because it does not fail, right? Every year I'm exposed to some sort of new therapeutic modality that I've never heard of before that people are very excited about. And then I look to see what's the evidence to support it and I find nothing or I find these really terribly done studies that weren't well controlled, that they're pointing to and saying, here's the evidence, here's the evidence. And I say, that evidence does not convince me. And here's why, right? So a lot going on there, right? It's hard to do good science. It's even harder to do good clinical research. But that's how we get to know whether or not something actually does work. So thoughts, responses, concerns, questions, what do you think? The other day, uh, someone I respected prior to them posting this posted something about, oh, masks cause diseases in kids. 
Um, and then the study that they referenced was like none of the gold standard things. And it was just really funny to me because it wasn't, it wasn't placebo controlled. It wasn't double blind. Um, it wasn't randomized. They just had kids who were wearing masks and then like their parents reported to this non-certified place like, oh, they had symptoms of like things that could have been attributed to like any other disease on the planet. But they were like, it's clearly because of masks. Um, and it was just, I couldn't even comment on the post and be like, hey, here you go. Because I would have to like send them your PowerPoint of why that that's not a thing. Like the knowledge gap was just, was just so far. And that, and that knowledge gap, Andrew, is such an issue with the public because they don't have training in how to conduct clinical research, how to interpret clinical research, or even basics of how to interpret whether or not this is a, a reliable study, right? Uh, and that's I think that's one of the most frustrating things for a lot of us is, okay, well, I can tell you why you're wrong but I'm going to need to talk to you for about three hours and I need you to read these six books so that you can <laughs> understand why it is that you're wrong. Right. And they're like, nah, I got this YouTube video. Pretty sure I'm right. People can't lie on <laughs> YouTube. Right. There's no lying on the internet. Uh, yeah. Very frustrating. Uh, I've had that with several family members about various things where it's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, tell me, tell me this. And it's like, well, I can, but you need some background, right? Like you didn't graduate high school. Um, so let me catch you up via this plan of study to the level of understanding so that you can understand why this is a problem. Um, and it's, I mean, and I'm not doing, you know, I'm not saying that to be like, oh, I'm so smart. But this lack of knowledge um, is a huge issue in terms of being able to understand and comprehend why something is or isn't accurate, uh, and it's and it's a huge issue. You layer on top of that these parents who are trying so uh, trying they're so passionate about getting help for their child that maybe the logic kind of goes out the window and ethos comes in, and that's their driving force of. I'm gonna just like hold on to whatever sounds right to me or whatever makes sense. But that lack of knowledge makes, you know, that would be where I would see that. But I hear that all the time from parents who are just seeking, well, how do I help my kiddo read better? Or how do I help my child, you know, with this or that? Um, I wrote a little bit about this, my what not to do about, you know, I just, my lack of education in certain areas needs to, I need to increase my my awareness and my knowledge in certain areas so I'm not feeding the problem of, you know, the parents wanting facts or best resources. Um, so I feel the, the the logic and then the emotional side of, of people or parents in this case just latching on to finding some sort of, you know, relief or help. Yeah, because because why do people seek out health treatments, right? And, and try to go to treatment providers because they don't feel well, right? Things are not going well. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about myself. I'm worried about my child. I'm worried about my family, right? Um, so mm -hmm. certainly desperation drives mm -hmm. a lot of seeking of things like, well, I went to this. I didn't try. I, I tried this. It didn't work. I got to try anything else, right? I'm, I'm willing to do anything else. Uh, and we see that all the time, especially with complex cases. So mm -hmm. it's just understandable, but also frustrating, I think. Mm -hmm. One of my students, um, and I wrote about this in my paper, uh, they have a, an extremely rare muscular condition that causes them to have underdeveloped muscles. And so um, their fine motor skills are underdeveloped. They can't track with their eyes. Um, they have to go to eye therapy. I've had multiple surgeries to help with these things. Um, and I worked with their student last year a lot on just trying to catch them up on, on basic things that they should be able to do. And a lot of my time was spent educating their parents who are well-educated, but just desperate at this point because their kid has a rare condition that only one or two other kids or people have in the United States. And 
you know, they're trying everything that they can and they're just desperate and these people prey on, on desperate people and it's really, it's really shitty. Um, so it's interesting to see that, yeah, it's an educational gap, but then they also are preying on just people's feelings and want to be heard and want to find something that will fix the issue. Um, and so I constantly had to be that bearer of bad news of like, this isn't proven to help, but what we're doing is. So let's stick with this. Don't spend your money on that. You know, at least give it, at least give it a month. And then if you, if you think that we haven't seen any improvement, then you can do what you want with your money. But let's do this first kind of thing. So um, it's interesting. Yeah. And that's, you know, honestly, that's, that's a, a big aspect of what a lot of evidence, provi evidence-based providers do is let me help you understand, right? Why this is something we need to work on. And this probably is, uh, which is, you know, very understandable, especially in cases like that, Tristan, right? Where it's, you know, I'm desperate for help, right? Like, what can I do to help improve the life of this child who, you know, I love more than anything else in the world? I'll do anything I can, right? Oh, this person says it can help. Let's do that. Let's try this. And we see this especially in severe cases, like, for example, a lot of autism, uh, where, you know, kids who, who have autism, a lot of parents are extraordinarily driven to try anything that they can to help make that child's life and their own lives better. Uh, and I think preying on it, as you said, is very much what happens with a lot of practitioners out there that are peddling these kinds of non-evidence-based things. Uh, they're doing it for their own good, not for the good of the actual people they're working with. which is actually what our next few uh, slides are all about, it turns out, is, you know, why people do these things. Uh, so a lot of people uh, will seek out these different kinds of CAM treatments because they're seen as being either like natural or there's, you know, there's not drugs involved. Uh, a lot of times they're actually easier to access or cheaper to access. So it's like, well, yeah, I can you get an appointment with a neurologist in about four months who specializes in this thing, or I can go to my chiropractor tomorrow afternoon. Um, or I can walk into Walgreens and look at the shelves and shelves of supplements and things like that. Um, and then we also see a lot of it is, you know, this conventional treatment or conventional medications, uh, therapies failed, right? Like they, they didn't work. So now I'm trying to find something that will, right? Like I'm, I'm kind of seeking that out. Um, and, you know, I, th I think, you know, we can all probably think of folks in our, our lives who, you know, have severe problems that didn't respond or, you know, haven't responded to more conventional treatments. Um, and you do get, you know, kind of increasingly like, I'll do anything, I'll do anything. Uh, so it's, it's understandable in many ways, I think, why people turn to these things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's good, though, right? There's a big difference there. Right? I can understand why, but that doesn't mean that it's, that it's okay. Um, you know, we also see that for a lot of folks, um, they're out there doing these pseudoscientific things, and they're licensed in some way. They're a licensed psychologist. They're a licensed, um, you know, BCBA. They're a licensed LMFT or LPC. So, I mean, if they're licensed by the state, they've got a degree in this, they've got training. Surely they're doing things that we know work, right? Sadly, no. Um, sadly, no. I mean, the vast majority of folks who are out there practicing, for example, in our state, are not well trained in evidence-based practice. Um, they really just, they aren't. Uh, and, you know, they might have received a small amount of training in one or two different kinds of therapies that are considered evidence-based, but they're not really practicing those uh, in a fidelis way uh, where, you know, they're sticking to treatment protocols and things like that, or they're doing things that are known to not work. Um, I can't even tell you guys how many of my patients that I've, I've seen who, you know, have been in treatment for years or decades with other folks and they've never 
even approached anything close to evidence-based practices uh, for fairly, you know, concrete problems that we know, here's how we treat those. Um, and we talked a little bit earlier about this kind of this not understanding the self-corrective nature of science, right? Like, here's why science changes, right? Um, <clears throat> and that's something that's, I think, hard for a lot of people to grasp, um, particularly if they're stuck in, you know, other kinds of mindsets where it's like, oh, no, this is the way that things are. It's like, well, that's how we thought they were, but here's new evidence that shows no, so let's shift, right? Let's change. And that goes for practitioners as well as people seeking those services. And then finally, a lot of this stuff does work, right? People do feel better going to what I would call placebo therapies. Um, you know, oh, I went and saw this therapist and yeah, you know, I saw him for about six months and things, things got better in my life. So yeah, I liked it. Okay, well, but did it happen because of regression to the mean? Did it happen because things changed in your life outside of that? Or did it happen because of the therapy? And so these are all things that we have to think about because again, people <laughs> do go into these um, getting very involved and, and spending lots of time in life. So, um, things to watch out for certainly is panaceas, right? So saying, oh, this will fix all these problems. Um, I've seen this, I can't even tell you how many times for different kinds of like supplements and things like that. Um, where parents are like, oh, we're taking these mega doses of vitamins to help cure this child's, you know, behavior problems. Uh, and it said they would fix all these things. It's like, well, they're not going to. Uh, so when something says it can fix everything, it's probably actually fixing nothing. Um, or people who are promoting it using words like, you know, this is an exclusive treatment or, you know, this is uh, a scientific breakthrough or, um, I can't even tell you how many of these therapies say things like that. The tappers, for example, the folks who are doing emotional freedom therapy and things like that, you know, they'll make these claims that, you know, they can, you know, change and treat your, uh, treat your trauma in minutes, right? That you've experienced for decades, your PTSD symptoms. And it's like, whoa, what? Like, that's a pretty bold claim. Uh, oh, well, well, you're releasing the energies, you know, in the different parts of your, it's like, okay, hold on. You're using a lot of these kind of medicalese terms or scientific terms, but not defining them. That's probably not too good. Especially if they're then trying to claim that, you know, the man is suppressing this product in some way, right? Or this therapy. Well, they don't want you to know about this because da, 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 da. And if you say, okay, well, what evidence do you have that this works? Oh, well, here's all these case histories, right? Here's these anecdotes. Here's people just saying this or that. Um, or this is the only place to get this treatment. This is the only one that works. We're the only people that do this. Uh, is it really? Like, you know, if I have a treatment that I know works, I'm probably going to try and train other people on it, right? I want that to get out there. Uh, and I want to make it as easily available as I can. So you have to watch out for that, people kind of throwing that out there as well. So, um, In terms of who's most likely to do these things, this is, this is, I think, important information, again, for our mental health practitioners, which is uh, middle-aged female, slightly above average education and income, um, which it's a lot of people coming in or bringing their children in for therapy, people who are desperate for help, right? Um, and then people who have multiple things going on. Um, and usually other treatments haven't worked well. And that's kind of our, our most typical group that we'll see um, that are coming in or bringing people in for treatment. Um, so let's kind of think about that. All right, let's pause for a minute. Give, let's give some uh, some feedback. What we what we think? Questions, thoughts, ideas. What we got?
Nothing. That's fine. On that last slide, actually, um, I have a friend who's a who's an MFT. Um, she's she has whatever process in her licensure she's at, whatever. Um, and she has a up until like last week, she had an undiagnosed medical condition that was like you know like one of the hard like autoimmune, hard to find the symptoms and hard to test and measure. Um, and because of her experience with doctors for like the past, you know, couple, whatever, decades of like not them not listening to her symptoms or her um, not having efficacious treatment, um, that's affected even how she like um, views the medical community or like views the COVID vaccine or like views some things like that just because her whole life, people didn't like give her good treatment. And so that's even started like a feedback loop of her being um, maybe a little less likely to look at like data proven things just because she's had, like she's the statistical abnormality that those things hadn't worked for on the medical side. Um, so I think that last slide was super powerful just because I know somebody. Who... Yeah, and that that's an all too common story, Andrew, sadly. Um... We see, we see a lot of folks who are kind of falling into these, um, you know, alternative medicine or complementary medicine um, kind of pits where it's usually not just one thing that you do. It's a lot of things, right? So um, one of the best examples I can think of this is if any of you go to a chiropractor's office, uh, they are very unlikely to only do chiropractic, right? We see an increasing amounts of these folks who are also doing acupuncture. They're selling supplements of some kind there. Um, they're peddling a lot of things that fall underneath this cam umbrella rather than just one thing, right? Um, and that's not uncommon where I do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And, this. Uh, and it's kind of a slippery slope. Uh, and it's exactly what you described, Andrew, where, you know, my experiences in this one area can start making it much more easy for me to fall for these other things as well, or believe these other kinds of misinformation. And it's, I think, uh, tragic in many ways because people then get caught up in these misinformation loops and they get stuck in what we call filter bubbles where they just see certain kinds of information and seek that out and they don't want to break out or hear alternative um, you know, views of what it is they're listening to, believing, hearing. I was gonna say something earlier along the lines of parents um, just wanting to try really hard to find good treatments for their kids. I saw a lot working in ABA, almost every single client I worked with, their parent was doing some other additional type of thing, like a gluten-free diet, a red dye-free diet, um, doing experimental trials, like everything under the sun to quote, cure and quote, autism. Um, and that was like one thing that the supervisors never really sort of like stressed the importance of because they were, were doing like evidence-based practice, like doing ABA and like, they were getting better from that and like their symptoms were you know getting better from that but the supervisors never really explained to the parents like why those other things were sort of unnecessary or sort of like a waste of like resources and time but then it's kind of like also the issue of like overstepping i guess and things like diets aren't necessarily like super harmful to most kids so i think that's something that like we'll see as practitioners more than anything is like our clients will most likely be doing like all these other additional things so it's kind of like the boundary of like giving the education but they still have the freedom to like do all those extra things i, I think that's great holly um and something that you know i encounter with almost all my my patients that i see and you guys will definitely see that too um what's really frustrating is that for a large number of folks who are doing some sort of conventional evidence-based thing and then doing these other things on top of it, they will then attribute success and change not to the evidence-based treatment, but to these other things. 
Like, oh, yeah, we're doing the ABA, but I think I've really seen a turnaround in his behavior since we switched to this red dye free diet. Oh, I think that's what's making the change. But it's like, wow, but you're doing this thing that we know is actually working. Uh, and that's, you know, super frustrating for a lot of our practitioners. Um, you know, something I can kind of have more of an authority just because I have doctor in front of my name, right? And so people will listen to me a little more easily than they will to a lot of other uh, levels of practitioners. Um, but I think it's very important to establish a solid therapeutic alliance and rapport. And then now I have an opportunity to give you some corrective information and feedback. Um, if I don't have that solid alliance or that solid rapport, it's, it's much more likely to be taken as an attack or now I'm offended because you said that this thing that I was doing wasn't real. So if you have that first, and then you can do some education and provide resources and things like that. Uh, you know, I, again, I do a lot of that <laughs> and uh, it's something that's necessary, I think, for us as evidence-based practitioners to do which is not just say, okay, here's the treatment I'm doing, but also help our clientele understand why is this a better alternative than this other thing? Uh, and, you know, that may mean you needing to keep abreast of uh, lots of different areas, and that's fine, right? Like that's, that's good for you to do. Um, or, you know, every five years you read the new edition of, science and pseudoscience and clinical psych or whatever to, you know, be like, okay, what is there out there now? Uh, or even, you know, hey, who do I know that I can go talk to to get information on whether or not this is true, right? Or, or whether or not you've heard of this kind of thing. Um, so knowing where to get good, solid evidence-based intervention information uh, is something that, you know, you all should definitely be keeping up. And then you can share that with your clients. I also thought it was interesting in the in the Hut book where they talked about um, how people are more likely to gravitate to those who have higher relatability to them. Um, I don't know where Dr. Lack just went, but I'll tell you guys. Um, I'm still here. Okay, it went like circled off and I was like, guess he's not here. Um, I'm still here. Um, I related really hard to that because being so young and working with children and when you go to the number one thing I get from people all the time is they'll ask, you know, like, hey, this is a behavior that I'm seeing. What could I do? And, you know, you toss out a few things that, you know, changing the antecedent, you know, reward that positive behavior. And they're like, oh, well, you don't have kids. So what do you know? And I'm like, you're right. I don't. But I was a nanny for a family for six years. A live-in nanny spent all six years with that family. Um, worked in a school for two years. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and I'm getting my master's. Like, you can lay it all out. Um, but, you know, you also have to, it's not personal. It's that, you know, they would rather hear what other parents are doing because that per that person's in the trenches with them at that point, especially like with, um, with like rare conditions, like my student that I mentioned, I also have a rare condition, so I kind of got a leg up there. At our school because nobody else could relate and they didn't have anybody that could relate to them and then I show up and I came in so that helped um, to kind of get that but like that is a big frustration that I have and I think it's a really interesting phenomenon that people will rather go to someone more relatable than someone who is more educated in that area which which happens all the time um, I I thankfully am old now, so I don't tend to have that much of a problem with that, but I certainly did when I was in your shoes, right? Um, when I was in graduate school, when I was even on internship where, you know, I'm doing a clinical child and pediatric health internship at one of the top hospitals in the nation. And then families are like, but how old are you? Do you have children? How many children do you have? Well, none, but I've got a lot of experience working with them. Uh, and I think that's a good fallback, honestly, is, well, I've been working with kids for, you know, you could say eight years, right? Or whatever. And they're like, oh, wow. Whoa. Um, but that's, that is a big issue is that relatability. Uh, and being able to 
kind of make yourself more relatable to the populations that you're working with, uh, for sure. One question I had is the, one of the things that I've seen is that America is a really narrative culture and people really prefer a story over like scientific proof or like, I know a guy or I heard a guy, um, which unfortunately the narratives are really great in propaganda and in pseudoscience because they're not using science diction or science mentality or science ideology. They're using, you know, like literal Hitler tactics to try to like manipulate and coerce people. And so how do you work with, how do you work against the fact that work, the culture is kind of predetermined to like stories instead of like scientific proof? And it, it's not, it's not just our culture, it's humans as a whole, it turns out. Um, we all prefer stories over data. Um, and that's, that's just how, a part of that is because of how we process information and stories tend to make things much more memorable than statistics uh, for most people. So I think that's a great, great question, Andrew. And the answer is we do the same, right? So we have the statistics, but we have the stories too. Right. So we leverage that knowledge of knowing, hey, like people love stories and they remember stories much better than they do actual like statistical analyses. Where I'm like, no, but you don't understand the Cohen's effect size was 1.93. It's incredible. You know, they're like, I don't know who Cohen is. Um, I have no idea what that number means. Right. But if I can say things like, well, you know, with this treatment, um, about 85% of people show improvement. So let me tell you, you know, one example, and then I can tell a story of someone that I saw recently uh, who was similar to the problem their child is having, the problem they're having. And I say, you know, and I worked with them for about, you know, this, this long, which is kind of typical for this kind of treatment. And here's what they were able to do afterwards, or here's, you know, how they were able to get back at school, you know, start doing X or Y, how their quality of life improved. So we tell those stories too, right? But we combine them with the evidence, right? So we give them both of those pieces because the other side of the, you know, the room, they can't do that, right? They can't say, well, we have, you know, this evidence or these clinical trials that show this or that happens. They can just say, here's our stories alone. And we've got both that we can leverage, right? We've got stories, you know, we've got those stories of how and why this works. Uh, so using those is not a problem at all because we can also then say, and you know, here's how it worked for this person and here's how it works generally. And so we can do both levels of that kind of communication, which makes a big impact. Well, and then at that point, you give the person the power to choose. Like, so you provided, I mean, I'm going back to Parker about there are facts and two things, science and opinion. You've provided both, but the opinion, that part being more the narrative, you provided both. And then your person, like the client can then take whatever they want. If they want to take the data and run with it, great. Or if they really connected with that story, then that's, you know, you provided two truths and whatever one that they want to choose to take then okay, then that works. Um, but I hear what you're saying. I mean, it just kind of, I think about my own parents, like political views or their like friends, religious values and things that are different than mine and hearing what they hold to be truth over my truth. Um, I, you know, you wonder, is that really just your opinion over my opinion or your facts over my, you know, it just kind of gets into that game. But I like the, the idea of providing both the stories and the data or the story with the data. Um, so then see where they go from there. Well, and it also starts modeling for them the importance of not just the story, right? But the importance of you tracking things over time to make sure that it actually works, right? So I've got literally these photographs of your child's head showing how their hair is growing back in now because of this treatment, right? We have these logs 
showing the decrease in vomiting episodes per week that this child is experiencing, right? Um, and you think of the stories and I've got the data and we can put them both together and it'll be all right. You know? um, but I think that's, you know, a very, very important uh, thing to think about is that, you know, I don't just overwhelm people with data. So even in this class, for example, right? You might notice that I do a lot of giving examples based on personal cases, not just throwing statistics and numbers at you. Why? Because we're naturally going to remember those examples more than we are the statistics in two years, three years, etc. Right? And then you can come back and look at the science and the evidence, right? Um, but we know that that's just kind of how people remember most. Other thoughts or responses, questions? I think I mentioned something something about this uh, in my in my paper. Um, so the requirements for a well designed uh, study is is the the double blind, randomized, placebo controlled uh, study. Uh, that those are obviously very high standards uh, for the APA. Um, and you, but their requirements is you only need two of those to be considered a well established um, treatment. Um, it it seems like the the standards are high for the initial research, but it doesn't necessarily seem to me, at least, that the standards are high enough in regards regarding the next step to what it what is considered well established. Yeah, so those guidelines were originally uh, developed in the mid '90s, um, and basically. The short of it is, is that um, there was sort of an assault on psychology because of all these new medications that were coming out, like Prozac and Zoloft, which were being touted as these kind of miracle cures for mental health difficulties, right? Um, and so those kinds of guidelines were actually made to mirror the evidence that was used to declare a drug efficacious. Uh, and get FDA approval for that, that particular kind of treatment. So basically, we were, we were trying to, with those guidelines, uh, say, look, we've got just as good evidence as you have, right, for these drugs that psychology works, essentially. Um, so that's, that's kind of where those came from originally, to give you a little bit of a backstory on those. Um, the, the other thing is that, you know, two trials doesn't sound like a lot, but it is when you actually get into the amount of effort it takes to run those kinds of clinical trials in that way, right? So like I can run a clinical trial pretty easily and make it a really shitty one, um, but it's hard to make a really good one that has all these aspects to it. Um, so, so two is, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually a, a, fairly, a fairly good amount. Um, and today, you know, compared to the mid-90s, today we tend to rely more on the meta-analytic data as opposed to just looking at, you know, two studies, right? So it'll be like, okay, let's look at all the studies that have been published over the last 20 years on this problem and see whether or not, you know, uh, it, it's effective. Um, so very few today of the studies or the treatments that are really considered kind of well-established um, only have two studies that support them, if that makes sense. So it's, it's kind of like this very minimum bar, and then most things have a lot more than that. But that's kind of where that came from, that minimum bar. Good question, good question. 